Banjo-Tooie is the sequel to Banjo-Kazooie, the popular platform game, uh, which features the bear Banjo and the Breagull Kazooie who lives in his backpack. Doing a sequel was, was fairly, it was a fairly done, it was, it was a no-brainer. So we did Banjo 2 next, and that was a much, much bigger game. It's basically a platform game where you can run around exploring big, vast worlds, collecting all kinds of stuff, musical notes, golden jigsaw pieces. We used some levels that were originally planned for Kazooie, were then rolled into Tooie. More worlds, more moves, more complexity. The big selling point for the second game was that you can actually separate the two characters. So you'd come across a, uh, a pad, step on that, and Kazooie would hop out of Banjo's backpack and go running off on a row and leaving Banjo there. It was a bit darker, it was a bit more difficult. It required maybe a bit more investment from the players. That allowed, allowed us to kind of have loads more abilities and and certain objects which you could only reach with Banjo and others you could only reach with Kazooie. And we had 150 characters that you met or you know that were, took part in the game and they all had animation and you know it was just a really big job. You could control Mumbo for the first time rather than just going to visit him. And he seemed to be quite a, a popular character in the first game. You could go and visit him and then take control of Mumbo and he, he kind of did various things with his with his wand and his little little stick thing. You'd have control over these big set pieces where you'd get Mumbo and he would make something huge move. One of the last minute things we tried to get into Banjo-Kazooie was multiplayer. I think we got it kind of going a little bit but it was just too big a job it was just a step too far so we, we held that back and you know we ended up putting a multiplayer section into into banjo tui early on we had a, a, a kind of a section or a mode where you had bottles revenge which was where you could i think you could play as dead bottles as i remember but i might i might be misremembering this another player rather than just watching someone play banjo could actually control all the bad guys and then try and thwart banjo's progress and if they managed to kill him, the roles would swap, so the, uh, the player that was playing the bad guys would become Banjo and vice versa. It was just turned off, it was just too much to do. It was just making a massive game even more massive. But you put the baddies in the hands of the players and it was like, you'd, you'd see some hilarious things where the baddies had trapped Banjo for like all the way through the level. Um, and we even put it in on one of the bosses. Uh, we put it in on Old King Cole, the, uh, the big coal boss that stomped around in, the, uh, in Chuffy's boiler. We kind of reluctantly decided we had to get rid of it, but it was resurrected in, in, in perfect dark in, in counter-operative mode, so uh, good ideas never die. They just uh, occasionally get delayed and then pop up in a different guise. I think the humour in Banjo, uh, and certainly a lot of rare games, is just a reflection of the of the character of the, of, the, of the people that are working on them. Writing dialogue for the characters, that was always good fun. Um, just seeing how many innuendos you could slip in and, you know, hope that they wouldn't then get, get cut afterwards. None of the dialogue, I don't think any of the dialogue was scripted. It certainly wasn't written down. Most of it was made up as we went along. Obviously, Banjo didn't have real speech. It was, it was all gibberish. So it was basically... <laughs> that kind of thing. I think they were eventually chopped up so that it sounded random, but that's much harder than actually getting some lines and, and trying to read them. At the time, it was the stuff that we kind of found funny, uh, like the kind of comedy, the kind of um, the sarcasm and the, and the dry humour that, that we, we'd almost been brought up on. There's a lesser known feature in Grunt Industries, the factory level, in that if you go into the servants' quarters, as you go in, on the left there's a toilet door, and there's a really, really remote chance, probably like one in a thousand chance, that when you go into that room, there'll be a light emanating from under the toilet door and if you go up to the toilet door you will hear one of the, the rabbit workers inside having just a massive massive dump i don't know where they got the sound a sound effect for that from he will kind of exclaim about his finger going to the toilet paper and splash back all that kind of thing <laughs> There's a lot of different bosses uh, in the game and we try to make them all uh, as different from each other as possible. I had the idea of, like, 
a baddie. It was like a like a welding torch. It was a bit crap. It was on a bit of paper and it had eyes on. And I'd actually put this bit of paper in the bin and I'd, I'd, I'll, I'll retrieve it from the bin. And it had like, it was kind of a bit sort of water stain from God knows what from the bin. And I, I put it in front of Greg. And he was like, oh, that could be a really cool boss, you know? And so it ended up being Weldar, which was the big boss in, right in the basement of the factory. And I, you know, it, so, so pleased with how that turned out. You know? It just goes to show, you know, no matter how bad you think an idea is, you know, just don't throw anything away because somebody else might see something in it and interpret it in a different way. So when Tui came out, um, it was very well received by the fans and uh, I think they felt it was a really good sequel. You kind of look at fans of the series and some players like the original and some like Tui and vice versa, so as long as players enjoy both of them. The worlds are a lot bigger and there's quite a bit of backtracking between them, which you know probably today you probably try and cut down on a bit. I mean, on the whole, you know, I still stand by that game. You know, for its time, you know, that was a great project. The kind of relationships between all the characters in the game, I think, I think that won't age. My first project and probably the one, you know, I'm that's probably closest to my heart, I'd say.